And so again, it goes back to not necessarily buyer values, but workers values. And so just inherently just being a human actually caring about what other people want, like it goes a long way. And I, I think that it's going to become even a bigger differentiator for all of our clinics kind of across the board because. Hey, hey, welcome back to the show. Got my buddy, Joey Albritton on the show. Uh, he's one of the uh, two founders at Rehab CEOs. Uh, Joey, what's going on, man? Not a lot, man. I can't complain. We've got a uh, somewhat decent weather here. It was like 90 here in Texas, so it was unprecedentedly hot. Um, but today we're in the 70s. So when you got sunshine, you, you can't really complain at all. There you go. It's uh, 58 in Brooklyn, like pretty normal, actually getting a little warmer. It's been like in the 30s. So in the 50s is kind of is a little weird for late February. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. All right. So today we're going to riff on sales uh in physical therapy physical therapy business practices uh, a lot of folks don't like the word um but it's kind of like it, it's vital it's necessary to kind of convey a lot of things convey why someone should come to our practice uh brick and mortar or you know have a home visit with with my specific practice or just conveying or presenting any idea or any you know any type of like you said in the pre-interview a little bit of leadership component so kind of like you know selling within the practice between uh, your team members, we're going to riff on all that. What's a good place to start or just like a high level um, intro? Um, I, I think one thing is to just kind of understand the actual intent behind sales. Because um, I think, like you said, there is kind of a stigma with like, of course, like the more heavy you are into business ownership and stuff like that, you do understand a little bit more of like, it is part of it. But it's like, well, does that matter if your actual team doesn't actually think the same way as well? And so I think just understanding that, like, we are trying to influence someone to make a decision that's in the best interest of their interest, not ours. And so we're never trying to convince someone because convincing is doing it on behalf of what we want and not what they do. And so I think if we can kind of remove ourselves from the actual outcome, which is hard because we're humans and we want to actually, like, always be doing the best we possibly can, but, like, an easy example of that is like, we could do this entire podcast. I could think I'm providing all kinds of value and you could be like, I hate Joey. I can't control the actual outcome of whether, whether you took something from it or whether you liked it, but I can show up and do as much as I possibly can to provide value. And so it's the same thing with like actually getting someone to move forward with a plan of care and actually not have surgery that they really shouldn't be doing. If they move forward with us, that's cool. But if not, Again, we did what we possibly could, and that's the only thing we can control. It's the same thing with goal setting. We have all these big goals because like everyone wants to be a millionaire. So if everybody has the goals, is it the goal setting that actually does all the difference? No, it's what are the actual inputs to try to get you to those outputs. And so it's the same thing with sales. It's like, did we walk down all those things? Did we exhaust all the ways to actually have that conversation? and then lead them to making the best decision, even if that's not moving forward with us as like their physical therapist. And so I think that just understanding that that's the overall theme is like getting someone to make a decision, even if it's not to move forward with you, that's all we're trying to accomplish with this. And that's the same thing even like with leadership too, because with leadership, we need them to make a decision. We need them to do the stuff. But a lot of times we don't have someone that wants to change in business because they don't inherently understand. And so we almost need them to sell themselves. And it's much easier to do that if we can sell them on why it benefits them. So like when in doubt, anytime you ever want anything or anytime you're trying to do anything with sales is how does it benefit them? Like when someone asks, do you take my insurance and you don't, the way you should handle that on the front end of a call every single time, regardless of whether you take it or not, is we have a lot of patients who take XYZ insurance but before we go down the rabbit hole of actually figuring out insurance coverage and everything like that, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions to see if it's even something that we can help fix? Because by doing that, you framed it as an actual time saver and benefit to them to one, you acknowledged it because if you're out of network, you still do take it. You're just billing on behalf of being out of network. You're saying this is a common place. You're in the right place, but none of that matters yet. It's going to be beneficial for you to answer these questions. So then we have a little bit more rapport. We have some more ammunition. And so we have to figure out, like, what is the benefit to them? And then once we do that, you'll be able to actually have better conversations versus like, no, nope, we don't do that. And then they just hang up. Right. And so I think just understanding some of that will get us a long way. But I think that that's at least a good starting point. 
is understanding why we need some of those cells and stuff like that, if that makes sense. For sure. I know like for fairly new practice owners, like let's say they take Medicare and then they take, you know, out of pocket rates for all the other payers, or they yeah. are running a cash-based practice, or they have some hybrid or whatever. They will always have a challenge in the beginning of answering the ins- the insurance question. Mm-hmm. And you kind of like, you could have coaches, you could have friends that help you, whatever, but it's like, it takes, I think, not just months, it sometimes can take years to get confident with that. And mm-hmm. then if you talk to that same therapist three, four, five years down the road, when they're busier, when they have more of a track record, if they're still answering the phone or doing the callbacks for the, you know, like the initial sales process, yeah, they don't need those patients then when they're, let's say five years down the road, like they're like, they can actually be like, they just can easily answer the insurance question. Cause they've also, they've had a lot of reps with it. Yeah. How can, uh, and they also like, they don't necessarily need that one specific patient. They're on a phone uh, a couple years into practice. They're on the phone with a patient and it's like, I mean, even if the patient comes here and they spend a grand or a couple thousand bucks, like that's great and all, but that practice owner that's already established, they don't need that one patient. And they're like, the confidence comes through on the tonality of speaking to the patient over the yeah. phone or in person. How can a new practice owner instill some of those, like the confidence and the tonality and almost the yeah. confidence of like, I don't need this one patient when they actually do? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question because it, it, it falls into the fake it till you make it, but I don't really actually like align with that because it's actually kind of like delusional for us to to actually like, oh yeah, like we, they, they should be coming here because if they should, you'd already be full. And so like, it is a little bit tougher. And the hard thing is like, you may have the conviction, but then you hire a front office person. Do they have the same level of conviction? So then you have to instill that in them. And so one of the things that you look at is when you first start, is honestly, you have to start like when you get Google reviews, when people start saying stuff, start your day out actually reading those Google reviews. Remind yourself of the changes that you're making with these people's life because it's going to be very, very hard for you to come into that conversation when someone on the previous call just told you no and you already had that in your head or you've had that call 500 times and you're just bored, but you still have to show up at the same level for every single person, no matter how many times you've said it. And so like even just some of the small nuances of like, having a standing desk so someone can actually like be moving a little bit more so they have better energy smile before you actually pick up the phone like it's it's very small nuance but smile like it comes through on your calls read your testimonials on the front end but as far as like okay well like i really need to make this sale there is no way like it, there is not a way to actually give you that level of conviction outside of showing someone that has the social proof that they've done it before. So you at least see someone who has a proven track record of doing it. And that's why I think mentorship and yes, some people may say like, Hey, you sell mentorship. So that's why you're saying this. But like, that's how we've expedited our business so much is is seeing people who's already done what you want to do and not wavering from that until you've done more than they have. Cause it's unreasonable that you would have enough reps to actually know more than they do. And so just by seeing other people being able to do it, you kind of have to, like, it's, it's a common phrase that we say in our community, it's it's borrow our belief. You kind of have to borrow our belief that that's actually something that's plausible for yourself until eventually your reps catch up with the fact that you should actually think that you're that good. As far as the, like, that aspect, it, it's tough. I mean, for us, we originally were working with, like, startups all the way to big guys on the coaching side. And now we only work with people once they are owner, admin, PT, and doing $30,000 a month in revenue. We literally had to cut people. It's not fun saying no to someone when you're like, yeah, I could make money here. But then you'll see that like your results get better with your patients because you're taking on the right people. And you'll see that you don't have as many complaints. You'll see that your therapists are happier. You'll see all those things that will start to just be a compounding thing that's very hard to visualize with data on the front end. But once you start to really have kind of, I guess, that swagger, I guess you'd, you'd call it it'll allow you to start attracting better clients. It'll allow you to have more conviction in the process, which will then a a never ending feedback loop because you're getting the right people there. Because like a lot of people for our guys that are out of network and stuff like that, one of the ways I kind of like, if we've already kind of distilled down a lot of stuff, an easy question that you can ask someone is if they say like, do you take my insurance or kind of going down that route is, hey, just out of curiosity, so I can have a little bit of a gauge on where you're at. 
Is giving the best possible outcome or using your insurance your number one priority? And by saying that, there's really only three things that they can say. It's best possible outcome. If you can't close that one, we, we need to go ahead and probably close down. It's I want to use my insurance. That one's likely someone you're probably not going to convert because if they don't care about actual results and it's only about using their insurance, that's okay. Refer them out. And actually have good people who you actually trust to refer that are in network. Because there will be times where you do that, they actually trust you so much because you didn't try to push them there, that they'll come back later. Or they'll refer someone who's actually okay doing out of network. But the most common one is, well, it depends. That's usually what most will say. And you say, totally get it. Well, what does that depend on for you? Then we get to the real actual meat of it. It's like, well, it depends on how many times I have to go. It depends. Uh, I mean, I've tried it before. Like, what makes y'all different? What's different? So then you get to the real objection versus the like insurance versus out. And that's when you can kind of get them to start selling themselves on like why they even reached out to you to start with. And so if you can kind of get into those things, it allows you to kind of differentiate that a little bit. But like they do it all themselves. And so that that's really kind of where you have to look at some of those. Do you think in general, the insurance question is just something that was passed down from everyone's parents, their their grandparents, and so so on and so forth. Because it's not like I, nowadays with consumers like you and I, we're going to look at Google reviews like of a restaurant or where like a new place, mm -hmm. or like we're going to look at Google reviews, Yelp reviews. We're going to you know look at maybe maybe you look at their Instagram of like a new club or a new resort you're going to go to or whatever. You're going to like perform some due diligence. Is the insurance question just like a lot of consumers? They just assume like every physician, every physical therapist, like they're most likely, hopefully they're licensed in the state and they're vetted. And like, there's no, like you said, there's no differentiator that they know of. And so it's just like any physical therapist, I'm going to, I'm going to Google physical therapy near me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start calling around and consumers have never really been guided or taught anything other than the insurance question. And I don't know, is it, is it from the parents? Like you were kind of shaking your head. So is it from our parents and their parents and all that? Mm -hmm. And then also I call places dermatologists, PCP office here in Brooklyn. And it's like, they're asking me what my insurance is, the front desk person there. So there's the bad behavior that has also been for decades and decades on the provider front desk side. Maybe it's yeah. a little bit of a mix of both. I don't know. It's 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 twofold. So you're, you're not wrong. I think it's definitely both. It's a filler question because most people inherently don't know better questions because if they knew how to make better decisions, they would already have probably started with you. And so it is typically a filler question because they don't know what else to ask and they want to do their due diligence. And so that's very common. I think you also have to look at like, how have we continued to train and what does the rest of healthcare look like? There's literally like nowhere else outside. Like hospital systems are like one of the only places people don't really ask too much about health insurance when you go in because they're just like, they're going to bill you and you're going to be surprised no matter what. That's just how they do things. Right. The only other place that sometimes goes down that rabbit hole is dental. Other than that, like chiros are cash, but sometimes they're insurance. But like you look at all the podiatrists, you look at the functional medicine, like you look at literally anything. The very first thing is like, well, they take insurance. Like, it makes sense. It's healthcare, like health insurance. This is health related. It should be covered. And so it's a very logical progression. But I, I think the other aspect is if we're at a network, we typically, or really in anything with sales, the most common objections you get are the ones you're most afraid someone's going to ask. Because you will actually bring out a lot of those insecurities and you'll lead people and so that's why, like, when we make the transition of, like, they're ready to actually get scheduled and you start talking about the fact that you're out of network, the transition's terrible because you don't feel confident in actually doing it. So then it actually makes you seem less convicted and less confident, seems more sketchy. Why is there a difference there? And so you then get more objections of, I'm trying to find someone that's in network. And so that is the inherent issue is we bring up the objections that we're actually worried about. That's why, like, we, we say it's selling from your own pocket. So like someone who doesn't have good actual sense of like their finances, it's very common for either providers or for front office, they get a lot more financial objections if they actually aren't comfortable with money. So like if I tell you it's $250 a visit and any of your providers, if they flinch at that, they're probably going to get a lot of actual financial objections because they themselves don't feel comfortable doing $250 a visit. And so they'll bring more of that out because they're uncomfortable. And then it seems scammy. It seems sketchy. It seems salesy or anything like that. And so I think it's twofold. I think it's just that's how we've always done it for so long. And 
the other aspect is most people's front office have never been trained ever because we we needed someone to schedule and that's all we told them they did it's like oh you just schedule you take some payments that's it and unfortunately that's how they trained them too they said here's our amr good luck and so we brought someone in with false expectations. That's why like most of our guys that are like either transitioning to be a little bit more out of network or our guys that are all cash, they pretty much hire people with sales experience and then they train them on the front office aspect of things because you need someone that's like, okay, being told no. You need someone that actually understands the actual nuances of understanding people. And it's not just like, and I, I don't want to sound like, you have your 80 year old lady who's there, who's like, they're just like never actually had to do sales. She's just doing all that. Like she's sweet, but like, it's a completely different industry now. And if we're not changing on some of those things, and you don't have someone that's open to having some of those hard conversations. It will detrimentally like just completely destroy a business. And so we have to kind of change a little bit of that. And we have to have a little bit more systematic way of training. The hard thing is the person who typically has enough context, assuming you're not going with a consulting company that has training on that type of stuff, is the owner. And if the owner were still in treatment, when do they have time to actually train? Because they're having to lose revenue to step out to then train someone, or they go to some of these like done for you services of hiring someone who trains them. But then every single time that those get replaced, they're then now dependent on that person, or they have to essentially get it to where they still have to give them so much context of how their stuff is specifically different. They've ever, never actually learned the skill set of training someone to be good. And so then they'll always kind of be stuck there anytime there's any retention. And it doesn't matter how good of a business owner you are, you will have you will have people churn in your front office. And so we have to have the skill of one, actually interviewing and finding the right fit. Like small hack, front office, we do group interviews on Zoom. You have 10 people on there because one, you physically can't interview enough front office people ever. And so instead of doing one-on-one, -on -one, you get 10 on at a time because two of them are going to no-show as, as all of y'all have done interviews. Like the amount of people that no-show interviews nowadays is, is absurd. Really? Two or three will no-show. Two or three will be all slunched over and you're like, oh my God, I'm glad I didn't waste a one-on-one -on -one time with that person. And then you ask them questions. And at the very end, the question that you ask is, if you weren't able to get the position, who here do you think should? And they'll all pick two people. And so now you don't have to be the judge of who does everybody resonate with because they pretty much told you. And so you end up 10Xing the amount of people you can interview, which increases your odds of actually finding a killer. And then you actually get it to where you have better contrast because like what happens usually is like you see maybe some red flags, but you're like, I'm desperate. I need to find someone. I only have so much time. And then you start to justify, oh, that it should be fine when they do that. And then you're three months removed and it's like, oh man, now I, in hindsight, I know I shouldn't have hired that person. It's because we didn't have enough comparison of like what good looks like. And so it allows you to have more reps. So you just get better at it because games are really one in the draft. Like they're not like, we they don't train all these NFL people to become like ridiculously elite. Like Harvard doesn't actually get people who are amazing by actually being Harvard. They just have a better interview process and a better filtration. And so that's a lot of what we need to do. But to do that, we have to be good at sales. We have to sell them on why they should come work for you. We have to sell them on the upwards potential of what they could become with your, your company. And so if they don't believe in all of that type of stuff, again, sales is a part of all of this type of stuff. And it's not just like the transactional patient to front office or provider to a patient, stuff like that. It's, it's all encompassing. Yeah. Let me run this by you. Um, this kind of has worked well for us on a call or a callback where if we can say the word insurance and cost first before they say it. So I'll, it would be like this. It'd be like, you know, hey, let's say, I don't know, Joey's the patient you wrote into our website, right? So like you haven't called in. And if some if you were to call in and you have the insurance question, you're going to, someone who's just focused on insurance, they're going to say it right away. Sometimes even before saying their name, we, we know, and they're like, you know, hello, oh, this is, this yeah. is Steve or Tommy or whoever. If uh, if a lead or a prospective patient comes through a website or a form or whatever, and the office is doing the callback, the therapy office is calling the patient, the prospective patient, what I've found to be sometimes effective is if the practice can say the words insurance and cost first. So it would be like, you know, hey, Joey, saw that you wrote into our website. 
I'm sure you're going to have questions around insurance and costs. We're going to get back to that, or or we'll say insurance cost and potential logistics because we're doing mobile, so we'll say that. But yeah. insurance and cost, and we'll come back to that. So, but I I touched on it, meaning now you don't have to do the the jumping in objection of like, do you take my insurance? It kind of gives the caller, the prospective patient, like we can put it to the back of their mind briefly. Now let's do what you said, which is let's let's make sure that this is going to be the right fit. Can yeah. you tell me about your situation because? I don't even know if we have a specialist that's an expert in your issue. Maybe we have to refer out. I don't know. So yeah. why talk about insurance first? Like, so Joey, before we talk about insurance and costs and potential logistics, tell me what's going on. And maybe your yeah. form captured that. So maybe your form, it says low back pain or whatever, sciatica. Yeah. And so you could lead off with that. Then you start, like you said, asking some of those open-ended questions. Yeah. What's important to them? Have you tried, have you had this before? How long have you been dealing with it? Have you tried anything for it? Self-treatment at home, YouTube videos, you know, yeah. whatever, massage, what like have you and now yeah. you're building rapport. Now, when you get to insurance and cost, now insure in network is probably a lot easier. And I would love to get your take on in-network versus out of network. And maybe yeah. arguably it maybe is not that different. But when you're gonna then say, Oh, we charge two, three, four hundred dollars a visit, I'll tell yeah. you what. It's a lot easier to mention it then after you've already built some rapport, had some yeah. open-ended questions. What are your thoughts on all that? I, I think you're you're hitting on some of the fact. Listen, this is similar to what we actually do on workshops as well. Because like a lot of people would do like you get 10, 30 people in the room, depending on your size of your spot, and you'll sell them and to pretty much teach them about back pain, balance, whatever it happens to be. And so literally on the front end of that, we're like, hey, like elephant in the room here, there's going to be an opportunity for work with us in a paid capacity. And you actually like hit that on the front end and it almost gives you like a sense of like, okay, I can relax. Like the, we he, we know he's going to sell us. I know he's going to sell us. Like we're, we're good here, but let's focus on this. Cause then like, otherwise, like there's so much anticipation that's being built there that they've ignored half of the other stuff that you've said because they want to actually do that. So I don't think it's wrong in actually doing that. We've never really tested too much of like saying that on the front end. Cause I usually just dig straight into it. It's like, Hey, I saw you that you had shoulder pain. Tell me a little bit more about what's going on there. Like then there's not even an option for them to actually get into the insurance side of things. But I don't think it would hurt you by saying that. Cause like I said, that's what we do on workshop stuff because we found when we didn't do it, like the the participation in workshops was significantly lower and the conversion rate was lower when we didn't address that on the front end. So I, I think that it makes sense that you would want to get into some of those things. I think some of the things on the, the in-network side of things, one, all of you that are in network, raise your cash prices, please stop discounting it. The amount of guys that are like, I have a hundred dollar average reimbursement, but it's less administrative burden for my, my team. So I'm going to charge less for cash because it's easier and they'll do that. So they'll be like, Oh, my cash rates, $80. Like, like if someone ran out of visits or if they didn't have insurance yeah, or they, yeah, if they didn't have it, they're like, my cash rates a hundred raise your prices. So then it actually is a price anchor now for your in network. So well, if you're, $200 a visit, you say, well, good news is normally this would be $200 a visit, but you have really good insurance. It's only $60 copay. Do you realize how that sounds significantly better than holy crap, you got a $60 copay? It, it sounds like much like, it yeah. sounds you, like you buy as many as you could. If it's 75% off, it's like, okay, like that sounds much better. So like you can do the same thing with Medicare too. It's like, Hey, like it looks like Medicare is going to foot most of the bill here. So like really all you'd be coming out of pocket is this. And so in between that or using a deductible as a price anchor is another thing that we found to be really helpful. And so for those of you, if you don't know what a price anchor is, we, we hit a really high price on the front end. So then whenever we say anything lower than that, it seems better. And so one way that they, they do this in like the fitness industry. So, hey, you need three times a week personal training at $200 a visit. You're going to need to do that for the next year. Now you got this like big $10,000 price anchor. It's like, but... I think really based on everything that we've seen here, you really probably only need to come one time a week and we can do this. So it's only going to be X, Y, Z. But for us, we can either use our cash prices as the anchor. So the actual insurance rate sounds significantly less. Or when we start getting into like a full plan of care and walking through like, hey, it's you're going to need to come two times a week for the next six weeks. You can then actually price anchor. But like Good thing is you're only going to have to come in for two times a week for the next 12 weeks. So like really max, even if you were cash, it'd be $2,400. 
And based on everything that we're seeing here, though, like you've got an $8,000 deductible. So you've got a pretty good savings there, but you're also in network with us. So it's actually going to be down here. So you have $8,000 price anchor because like their only other option is probably surgery. Every surgery is going to make them hit their actual deductible. And so now you have an $8,000. One, they don't want to have surgery. Two, it's significantly higher. And three, the other way you actually anchor that is, and what most people don't realize is after you have that back surgery, where are they going to send you afterwards? They're going to send you to physical therapy. Would you be open to hearing an option to where we could actually skip the surgery, not hit your deductible, and have something that's a little bit less invasive? And so when you word it that way, it's like, well, why the hell would anybody want surgery? No one wants to hit an $8,000 deductible. No one wants to pay cash. Now all of a sudden, they, they got good insurance. It's like, well, can I do three times a week? Like you literally will have people lean in. It's like, well, how many can I have? You can come in as often as you want, man. Like, like you do you. We'll, we'll have you come in. So like it, it'll allow you to really have significantly easier conversations around the financial side. But that's why so many of like the, because people say like, oh, you don't understand. I'm in a rural area or I'm in a low socioeconomic area. Like realistically though, there, there's only two things that you have to look at on this. Like, Rich people stay rich because they don't actually want to spend their money. So socioeconomic status doesn't actually necessarily mean anything. Poor people stay poor because they like to spend their money. So if you actually think about that, lower socioeconomic places should actually be easier to sell. Is there, and there, we've actually seen that to be true almost across the board because they just spend it. Because if they're not spending it with you, they're spending it with someone else. They're spending it buying some type of massage gun. They're spending it going to get massages every week. They're spending it on a TV. And so you know that it's better. So like we need to have those options. But then the other thing to think about is like the amount of clinics that we're in that like don't have financing options. It's absurd. Like go to your local dentist. There is not a single one of them that don't have financing options. Like, go get care credit. They are, most people already have care credit. They have it in their dental office. It can be used as physical therapy because there is a direct relationship between the amount of financing options and the amount of money you'll make as a business. Because most people don't care about the total investment. They only care about what is the monthly payment because that's how most people live their life. That's how most people are over leveraged on houses. You got people here in Texas with $100,000 trucks and they only make $50,000 a year. Like that, 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 there's a reason for that. And not that we're wanting to get people. Sometimes those are the folks sometimes that will object about like, why, why don't you take my insurance? Like, why would I go to you? You know, but you're right. Like I even going back five, six something years of doing home visits in New York city, like sometimes there be some of the resistance of folks on the front end of like, oh, that's expensive or whatever, whatever. And I've been in so many different apartments and homes and all that. And you see spenders people with amazon boxes coming all the time items in their home that are just consumer centric like not providing i I mean i'm from my from my bias i'm like (laughs) you know like you're like for your for your cat and it like drips water like a water fountain to like you know your cat water that moves like something ridiculous and sometimes those are the folks that are insurance focused but they are, to your point, they are also spenders. And and if you frame things differently, like you said, if you position yeah. it differently, like your example of like the cost yeah. of the surgery and the deductible up front, but if you didn't have to do all that, yeah. it, it makes your offering sound a lot more appealing now. Well, and that, then sometimes even just saying like, if someone says it's expensive, you say, I totally get it, but expensive compared to what? And they're like, well, uh, and then they'll kind of actually start to waffle because it's like expensive compared to what? And then it's like the only thing they can logically compare it to is surgery. It's like, well, like, okay, so like that's very cheap compared to that. But then also sometimes like, is it are we trying to save money on the short term or on the long term? Because really, if we're actually looking at stuff, it's actually more expensive for us to save more money on the short term by you actually going to do these other options. But if we're looking for long term results, which like, I assume you're looking for long, long-term results, right? And so then like, you have to say like, yes. Okay, so for actual long-term results, we actually save money by doing this because based on everything that we're seeing here, we should be able to eliminate X, Y, Z without you needing to go have surgery, without you having to take off time from work, without you having to hit your deductible, with, and just keep layering on all of those things. So it's really just a matter of like, do you want to save money on the short-term or the long-term? 
And then they'll have to really kind of answer some of that type stuff. But there is expenses that, that people don't see financially. Like there is actual time expenses. So like, that's what a lot of times for our cash guys, it'll like a lot of them will see someone maybe one, two times a week, where like a lot of our insurance guys will see three to two times a week is average. So there's the expense of taking off work. There's the expense of travel. There's the expense of all of that type stuff. And just how long does it actually take to get better? There's the expense of like opportunity cost as well. And I, I think that if you're looking at one of the things that most practices in general do a, a poor job at is extrapolating like the actual cost of inaction and what happens if they don't continue to do it. So like an easy way to actually like ask that and ask the right questions, like, hey, totally get it. If you weren't to move forward with us, what are your other options? Well, what, if, so, what if they say, well, I'm going to keep calling around until I find a place that takes my $30 copay insurance? Say, I totally get it. But out of curiosity, why is it that you called us first? What is it that made you resonate with our ad? Well, Joey, I called four other places first. Yeah. And so, so that, that's the thing. It's like, what, it is, what is it that they didn't provide that you're still looking for? And so they, like they'll be able to start selling themselves on all of those type things because that's usually what it is, is they've had bad experiences. That's why they're reaching out. They saw an ad that resonated with them because the review, they saw your reviews, they saw something. And so usually it's much easier to get them to sell themselves on because like if they've tried physical therapy before, an easy way to ask that is like, well, what did you like about them? Because if immediately if you're like, well, what did you hate about them? And you go like negative, they don't open up because they don't want to be shit talking people. And so it's like, well, what did you like about them? And it's like, okay, and what do you, what, I mean, if you could improve anything about it, like what, what would you have improved? And they're like, well, I wish like, I really hated, like I kept switching therapists and, or like they kept trying to push dry needling on me and I'm afraid of needles. It's like, oh, so now we know very different things. So I think even just understanding those things, it's, it's it all comes back to buyer's values. Like what is important to them? And that's what we're going to sell from then on. We can always educate them on all the stuff on the back end, but we have to sell them what they want to then build enough trust to give them what they need. And I, I think that that's a discrepancy that we don't hit a lot. I love that you brought that up. And uh, there's always a great, easy, like you said, a tactful way to ask. Like if there, if you ask or the front desk or whoever your admin is asking, so have you had physical therapy or have you had any type of treatment? Have you tried treatment for this in the past, et cetera? So if they say, oh yeah, I went to XYZ physical therapy, Almost always, in my opinion, it's like, well, there was something. It might not, have, and they don't want, they don't, like you said, I agree. They don't always want a bad mouth mm -hmm. that place. So they'll be like, oh, like, no, I just, you know, I'm looking for something different. Now, in my, now it's for me, it's like most of the time they'll say a brick and mortar place and maybe they yeah. have some issue where they want someone to come to them. And that's what we yeah. offer. Um, but sometimes it, it's some of those things, like you said, like, oh, I felt like a number at this place. Uh, mm -hmm. There was too many patients in there. The therapist was running around. It could be the therapist was too, you know, manual therapy was too aggressive or it wasn't enough or whatever. Yeah. If, you can, if you can bring that up, if you can get that out of them, mm -hmm. then you can say, like for us, it's like then when we're matching them, that caller, that prospective patient with one of our therapists, mm -hmm. then I will, we will pass that on to the therapist and say, hey, she had a, he or she had a bad experience yeah. at a place and she didn't like manual therapy or didn't like, well, we can't do dry needling in New York City, but, or yeah. in New York. But, um, you yeah. know, they didn't like this. They they had a bad experience and this is what they said about that. So making sure that the actual treating therapist knows to not do, you know, a grade five minip if like yeah. you know, chiropractic irritated their back before or something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's important to know that stuff because the amount of people that we'll have who are like, oh, hey, do you do dry needling? And immediately they're like, finally excited that someone actually called them for dry needling. They start to like geek out on, oh yeah, we have dry needling. We have all these different packages. All of our guys are trained. And they're like, well, I'm afraid of needles. And it's like, well, I mean, uh, you don't really need dry needling. I, I don't really think it's uh, going to be applicable. I mean, you kind of have to backpedal. And so I think that's also a very common thing that is underutilized is actually asking for clarification on why someone asked it to first in the first place. And so I think usually we haven't implied what they are thinking on why they're asking, but a lot of times it's not the case. And so it's very easy to start going down and selling what you think is important versus what they actually think is important and what they're trying to gauge from that. So like a big example of that for us inside of ours, we do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. We also do group coaching. We have some videos, we have some stuff like that. Well, a very common question is, do y'all do group coaching? 
used to, I'd be like, oh yeah, we do some group coaching. And then we're like, oh, well, the last place I did group coaching and it sucked. And it's like, oh crap. So now it's like, well, wh why is it that you asked that? And they're like, okay, well, I, I really love group coaching. So like, then yes, we're going to highlight that we do group coaching. So it just makes it a little bit easier because if you know those questions and they're like, oh, I just didn't want it because I, I feel like I only worked with the tech. Cool. We don't use tags. Or I felt like there was four people in there at a time. Cool. We don't, max you'd ever see is two there or max you'd ever see is one. And so you can kind of highlight those things because it just makes it inherently more valuable. Like that's, that's really all it comes down to because for me, as a patient, I don't actually like being seen 60 minute one on one. Like it's awkward for me as a patient. I, I don't like it. Like I know every cash guy's like, I, we got to do 60 minute one on one, but like that's boring to me. Like Tony Maritato had a really funny analogy of this. He's like, imagine going to a very like five star restaurant. You're the only one in the entire restaurant. The chef brings out your food and he just watches you eat the whole entire time. That's essentially the environment that I feel like 60 minute one on one is like I, I really love like 60 minute scheduling, but every 40 minutes someone comes in. So there's a little bit of overlap, but you still have a lot of one on one, which not all places can afford to do that, depending on their average reimbursement. Like if you're in network pretty much across the board in New York, you probably can't afford to even do that. You probably have to have higher volume, but like it's it's nice to know what people want. So then you can actually make sure that it fits them. Because like for me, if you're like 60 minute one on one, I'm like, Ugh. or like my mom, she's very like anti, she doesn't like people massaging her and doing stuff. So if you sold her manual therapy across the board, she wouldn't want to come back the next time. She would because she knows she needs to, but she'd be uncomfortable the whole time. And she sure as heck isn't going to be referring everybody to you. And so I think just understanding those things, but it's also the same thing with our staff. Like, I, I think that everybody has nuanced differences of kind of those. And this is maybe not necessarily like a sales thing, but it's just as important to understand this. A lot of our guys will be looking at like payment compensation models for physical therapists and stuff like that. And they'll be like, oh, well, this one like has a lot of actual benefit because it's got profit sharing. It's got these extra KPIs. If they hit this, they make more money. But then in reality, like most of your therapists actually just like stability. And so finding out what they actually like about that, some of them want more PTO. Some of them want flexibility to go pick up their kid at 4 p.m. Some of them actually want the more upside. And so understanding those things and actually being able to allocate the things to make it make sense. Of course, you can't go all crazy and everybody has different stuff because then it's just a logistical nightmare. But there is more room for flexibility. And we have to get into some of those type things because like the market for hiring is not the same as it was five years ago. Like we definitely have to adapt to make sure that we are able to do that, but that's so we can sell them on the position that they need to and sell them on essentially why it makes sense to work with you versus the hundred other people that are trying to hire a PT right now. And so again, it goes back to not necessarily buyer values, but workers values. And so just inherently just being a human, actually caring about what other people want, like it goes a long way. And I, I think that it's going to become even a bigger differentiator for all of our clinics kind of across the board because the communication skill of the class that's coming out of school right now is atrocious. And I can say that because I didn't graduate that long ago. Like I was a, a second career student. So like I was back there and some of them were very highly like, but like as you get into younger and younger and younger, it's like, oh my God, like, they just don't even know how to communicate anymore. And so like, we have to be able to communicate to help make up for the fact that that's the case. Because if we can be the one that communicates, all of our competitors won't have the skill set of actually being able to transfer that skill of communication. And I think that that's where we'll be able to delineate kind of everybody across the boards, because that's really all sales is, is communication. And that's all leadership really is, is communication. Who can actually convey what we want people to do to where it's in the best interest of both the employee and the owner. So that's really what it all comes down to. With the, with the team communication or the team like selling or influencing when we're talking about leadership, I mean, it's, it's also just, it, it could be your offering, like reminding your team, like, Hey, that next visit, we're talking about completed plans of care. Like that person, that patient's next visit is not guaranteed. Like we need to be mm -hmm. demonstrating value at every single visit, talking about what you might be doing with them the next visit so that they're looking forward to yeah. they actually have a reason to continue to come back yeah. and more likely to complete their plan of care. I mean, all of that is communication, leadership, a little bit of selling or, or influence or whatever you want to yeah. call it with like your team members. 
Yeah. Yeah. And for some of that, man, like it's, it's, it, we already inherently do it. We just don't realize it's called sales, like of, of getting someone bought in on stuff. Any of y'all who do treatment that's test retest, that's literally showing that, you know, how to test retest, like just keep doing it. Test, treat, retest, like keep doing that whole thing. Hey, you were like this and then you looked ridiculous because you had no range of motion. We did this and now you can actually reach here. Huh? I wonder if we'll get more buy in there. Did we have to manipulate them? Did we have to do anything crazy there? It's like, no, we're just being PTs. But like, you also have to make a point of actually acknowledging this is where they're at. Because otherwise, people kind of forget. And so that's why like some of the small nuances of what we do in clinics, it's like, get a wind board inside your clinic. So that way, when someone comes in, instead of being like, hey, how's your pain today? Or, hey, how are you doing? And them coming in and be like, well, I'm here, ain't I? Or like nine out of 10 pain. And like, they're just negative the moment they come in. Instead, it's like, well, share a win since last time you're here. Like, what were you able to do since last time? Because business owners, just like patients, kind of have amnesia of like what we've been able to accomplish because we continue to move the bar. Like you hit one revenue goal and all of a sudden it's the next one and you forgot about the fact that that was even a big deal. Patients are the same way. They, since the progress doesn't happen, like literally like overnight, they start to make progress. And then you're like four weeks into a plan of care. And you're like, what do you mean you just ran a mile and you haven't ran a mile in the last 20 years? Like, why are we just finding out about this? And so if you do that, you force them to actually acknowledge it, which then, of course, gets more buy-in, which helps with sales. You then get them to go write it up on the whiteboard, which then allows you to have an opportunity to say, hey, we've got a lot of other patients who have similar issues just like this. Is there any way you could share that as a Google review? Then you now have reviews, which is then marketing, which precedes stuff. So you have more authority. Then you take a picture of it. That's your social media for the, the week as well, because you had all these wins. Now you got people wanting to come back because everybody wants to win. Because when you think about it, it's like, as adults, when was the last time we ever like, had our rate our, our hand raised and people celebrated us like it's been a while like That's most people that does not happen in their day-to-day -day life and so if we can do that or like have a gong that they hit when they graduate like all of those small little nuance kind of like environmental sales marketing kind of things it starts to really bring the energy up and that's like the whole like high energy is buying energy and that's why like when you meet some owners that are struggling they've had such a hard time getting out of there. It's like, no wonder that no one wants to be there. Like you don't even want to be there. And so sometimes you kind of have to self assess of like, well, if I don't want to be there, well, why would anybody else? And what can we do to change that? And so that's why like, you kind of have to go back to like your ultimate why, because like there's going to be days as business owners, you're beat up. Like it's inevitable. Like anybody who tells you that business doesn't have like ebbs and flows and you're getting kicked down and all that is probably selling you something. And so we kind of have to refocus that and then refocus our team on like, what is the vision of what we have at the company? Because that's the other aspect is if we don't have a big enough vision, all your A players start to leave because they're like, hey, I've already kind of maxed out what I can do here. So then you have staff churn. And so we kind of just need to figure out what we actually want out of the business first. And I know it sounds silly. It's like everything goes back to mission, vision, core values, but like, the bigger and bigger businesses you build, the more you realize the foo-foo stuff is actually the, the important stuff. The reason it's so hard is because there's very, it's very, very hard to measure. Like all of the soft skills, the reason that, that they're not hard skills is because they're just hard to measure. It's very, very hard to do that. But I think the people that focus on that significantly more, their KPIs will naturally get better. But that's why like graduation rate is one of the things that we really focus on. Like, the national graduation rate from physical therapy is 9%. It's atrocious. Crazy. So like if you just get to like a 40, 60%, like it fixes everything else. They refer, they review, they have long length of stays. They don't worry about how much it costs. They, they keep coming back for the next time. Like they tell their physician that you're amazing. Like all of those things all come into play. And it's not like, oh, what's our no-show cancellation rate? It's just like, what's our arrival rate? Like how do we get people to want to be here? How do we get people to want to do their exercises? How do we get people to actually want to drive through New York traffic and actually do all that crap to want to be here? So for you, you you've already solved that solution. You just drive to them or walk to them, depending on where you're at. But like, <laughs> so like you've solved that, but not everybody can solve that. So we do have to account for some of those things and kind of how you talked about of like hitting price point, hitting insurance, hitting all those things ahead of time. 
sometimes even hitting some of those things from like an objection standpoint is also things that we need to do. So if you're having a high no-show cancellation, right, it's like, hey, I got you down for Tuesday at noon. But just so I'm clear, like, is there any reason or anything in between now and then would prevent you from actually being able to come in? Make them think about it. Because like when I was a dental hygienist before this, the amount of times everybody's like, I'm gung-ho, I'm going to start flossing now. I'm going to start flossing. Six months later, no one's flossing. Then you actually start to walk through. It's like, hey, like, whenever you go home, what do you do daily right now? Oh, you charge your phone every single night? Cool. Go put your floss by your charger so we make sure it's there. So like, just like their home exercise program, what do you do daily? Oh, you watch Netflix every single night? Cool. We're going we're gonna to put something there that reminds you that you need to do this. And then it's the same thing. Appointment reminders. We do our 24-hour out call if we see that. You may only do that for certain insurances because maybe you know that Medicaid has a higher no-show cancellation rate. Right? So you call those only because you don't have the bandwidth to do it for everybody else. So there's there's things that you can do, and it doesn't have to be universal, but you just have to make sure that it's in, it, you incentivize the people or let them know of why it's important the things they need to think about ahead of time. It's like when we had the big snowstorms like two or three weeks ago in a lot of states, the amount of people who are like after the snowstorm came, even though we had like a week of people preparing, saying that all the snowstorms are coming in, they're asking us, well, how do you do telehealth? I'm like, well, two weeks ago, you start educating your patients of this is how you log into your stuff for telehealth for the storm that's coming in. So we have to hit that stuff ahead of time so that way you're actually ready. Know that your therapists know how to do it. Know that your old elderly patients actually know how to log on their smartphone so that way it's easier. With the the wind board, what have you seen to be the best, like dry erase boards or chalk boards yeah. or like what what have you seen in clinics? Yeah, literally like a dry. I mean, I've got a this this board like if you're on YouTube here, so like I got a little like it's like a glass whiteboard almost. Um, but yeah, just a dry erase board because one of the things that you typically we we do on the bottom of it too is you you write on the bottom of it a good referral for us is, and then you put whatever it is and you change it all the time. You change it once a week. A good referral for us is someone who can't sleep at night because every time they roll over their shoulder, it hurts. Someone who can't tie their shoes because their back hurts. Someone who can't bend over X, Y, Z because their knee hurts. Because most of the time, the only reason people don't refer to you is because they don't know who they can refer or they don't know how. And so the more ways we can kind of see that with like that or a family and friends program or something like that, people are more likely to do it because people inherently want to have the small businesses grow and not the big change. They want to support you. And so we put that on there. We put that like we, you have like the, and it always sounds lame, but you got the little trivia questions that they always have. Like anytime when I was doing my, my, my um, shadowing hours before I went to PT school, any of the big chains, they always, they always had their trivia. I don't know why all the big chains do their trivia, but the amount of old people that come in they're like what was the answer to the trivia question last time like it, it gets them excited it's like the, it's like the daily crossword so you can have stuff like that so there, there's definitely more stuff that you can do than just the the actual whiteboard but it's a very easy low cost option for you to do that just completely changes the environment because imagine you go from no one really actually expressing their wins to at least maybe, because not everybody will do it. They'll be like, oh, I can't find a win. And half your therapists won't want to do it initially. They won't be bought in on it and stuff like that. But then it starts to happen. And then the energy changes. And then it actually makes your therapist happier. Because no one really wants to work with the pain in the butt patient who just complains the whole time. But they don't really mind working with the one that actually is a little bit higher energy now. So like one of the questions that we always asked back when I was in the dental field too I had this like very hippy dippy assistant. She was kind of crazy, but like one of the questions she always asked is, What are you grateful for today? Mm. The amount of times I've had people who were pissed off about finances because the place I worked at was a little bit sketchy with some of their financing and billing and stuff like that, or the people who came in, they just got out of traffic, they already had a hard day. And she literally would just stop them in their tracks and say, what are you grateful for today? And sometimes it would be like a, a two minute wait. It's like the longest two minutes you'll ever experience. But the amount of people that completely their tone and energy changes, because the last time they were probably asked what they were grateful for was Thanksgiving. That's the only time anybody ever asked them that. And it will completely change the dynamic of a really, really bad patient to being at least average. 
So we, we may not be able to change someone completely, but like it's it's wild just some of these small nuanced things. So we can really create and concoct an environment that's actually better for sales. Like that's why we have like, because I know you and you and Ron Miller are big buddies. Like you've got the big walls of all the people who've graduated. So then there's social proof there. You've got all the big certificates of all the like stuff that you've like, this is the only time alpha, the alphabet suit behind all of the physical therapy names actually care. Put them in your evaluation rooms. So at least at a minimum, they're like, hey, they seem to know a lot of stuff. I don't know what any of that is, but they know a lot of stuff. I'm probably in the right spot. Like if we can start to build those things, it becomes less about the sales. Like the only reason we have to sell is because we have a crappy brand. And in a local business, the only thing that brand really is, is do we get people results and do we have good customer service? It's not the, oh, I need to do social media content. I need to do all that. Like I've got guys who have like no Instagram following, all the way to guys that have 200,000 people on their Instagram. There's practically no difference in the amount of new patients they see. Organic is really for lead nurture, not lead generation. And so since we see that, then it's, okay, well, branding's not necessarily around organic social media. Then what is it? It's, do we get results? Do we have good customer service? And do we let people know about that? That's all it is. Because once you stack so much of that, like, you don't have any issues. Like, I've got John, Mc, John McGee's one of our clients down in West Chase. He's Shout got, out like, Tampa. He's got like 795 star reviews. You go to his website, best of awards the last three years. He puts it in his email signature. So every time he sends something to a to the physicians, to patients, to all this, like you don't land on the one that has the, the best of awards the last three years and 800 five-star reviews website and say, yeah, I think I'm in the wrong place. It just doesn't happen. And so like, that's why he doesn't really have much issues ever. Like we haven't ran Facebook ads for his clinic since Robbie and I merged. The only thing we've ran Facebook ads for is like his wellness stuff because he hasn't needed it. And so it also attracts high level talent because like the thing that most people don't realize is just like everything else, we build this stuff to make sales easier. Well, the same thing for hiring. When someone goes and looks at a, a, an Indeed post, What's the very first thing they do? They go Google Waco Physical Therapy. Huh, I wonder if this place is any good. Let's read the reviews. Let's look at their best of awards. Did they win all these? Oh, let's get the staff bios. Do they have any testimonials from their staff? Like, that's why, like, that's all super important. So we can kind of fix those things. But it all ties together. But, like, there's no, like, one silver bullet for any of it. It's like we have to stack all those things until eventually it feels like it. It's like the overnight success. It's like you do stuff for 10 years and all of a sudden someone blows up. It's like, no, we change stuff at 1% for five years. And now it's like, oh, like they just don't, they don't miss, do they? It's like, no, like, but it takes time. So I think that that's the other thing is giving yourself permission to have a learning curve. But to your point, originally in the start of this, it's like, there will be a curve. Like even from like Facebook and Instagram ad leads, they convert at a lower rate than Google's or, or Google leads a referral because they don't already know, like, and trust you. You almost have to just get punched in the face like 15, 20 times before you're like, oh, like this is how these calls are going to go. Like that, that's how this works. But then you do it and you've learned more within 10, 15 calls than you have with like any other sales training or any other sales book you ever could have gone through. Because now you actually have context to pull from to actually apply all the stuff. But like, that's why we have so many free resources on sales though. So that way, like you can expedite that curve, but there will be a curve. Like it, it, it is just part of business, unfortunately. There's always a curve. Do you think there's more of a curve with cash or out of network rates compared to in network? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, honestly, if, you, if you're having a hard time selling in network, you got big problems. And it's not even, it's sometimes it's because we we have an issue actually determining what is best for the person. We actually have an issue determining what is actually like, can we get them better? That's why new grads are so hard to actually work in an out, out of network clinic. They don't even know if they can get a better yet, much less can they sell a $4,000 package. Got to have and, the couple chops. And so that, that's the thing is so like, and since we haven't held our staff accountable to graduation rate, to actual outcomes, because for most people, they only see outcome measures as a thing we have to do to get paid by insurance companies. 
That's the issue. We don't have the irrefutable data that we actually get results. So then we sell from a place of inferiority and then wonder why people don't want to pay us what we want. And so for in-network, it's significantly easier. Like anybody who tries to tell you different, like, no, like in-network, like it is very, very, very easy. But that's why like, you don't see anybody that's 10 clinics deep that is 100% cash. And really, as you get bigger and bigger, the guys that were just doing super bills and giving them just like straight up cash, they all start transitioning to starting doing out of network billing because it actually makes sense at scale because then it lowers the threshold for someone to still, quote, use their insurance. Right. And so like that's the natural transition we see. Like typically it's like, or got a lot, of, a lot of the guys that are starting clinics now, they're cash or maybe they take one or two insurance. It's like a Medicare, or Blue Cross, Blue Shield, depending where they are. And then as they get to about three, four providers, they start to lean in a little bit more and they start to do out of network. And then it always starts to kind of bridge. And then like the bigger and bigger you get, you pretty much have to see like, do we have the actual supply for therapists in this area? If we do, do we have enough actual demand for the high ticket cash? And if we do, then don't take insurance by all means. Like, please don't. It doesn't make any sense. But if you're like, hey, I've got enough room and I could do it, but like we're still getting bottlenecked here. Like I've had so many guys who are were like brainwashed by like some of the cash guys of like insurance can't work. When in reality, it's like really the, the vehicle doesn't matter. It's just like, what is the destination we're trying to get to? We can figure out the way to do that. But if it's like, I want to get out of treatment as fast as possible, still be profitable, cash is not your way. You need at least three therapists before you're out of treatment at a good profitability standpoint. Cash is not the way. That does not scale super fast unless you're pelvic. Like pelvic is stupid. It, it grows super quick. Like that's just where it is. There's a, a demand there. But again, can you find enough pelvic PTs to get out of treatment? So there's there's a lot of kind of nuances to some of that stuff, but insurance is definitely easier out of network. Actually, I found out of network is harder for people initially when they first start to sell it because they don't understand the whole aspect of it. So it just confuses the patient. And then cash is the easiest as far as like price clarity and being able to kind of pitch it on that side. So it's in networks the easiest, then cash and then out of network. But once you get used to actually walking people through out of network billing, it becomes easier than cash. But there is, again, a learning curve, but also because like you don't even know what kind of coverage the ADA network is going to have because you don't know have all the data in your area and some of that type stuff. And so then it's like, well, maybe they'll pay me. Um, like, I don't know. We'll see. So then you kind of have some like, should I be charging more for this on the front end? Like, hopefully they'll pay. And so you kind of have that in the back of your head too. Yeah. I mean, we use an out-of-network biller for that. And I mean, I know there's some PTs that just do, they bill out-of-network. They actually submit claims to out-of-network on their own. If you are able to do that, great. I just don't want to be on the phone. I don't want my team, anyone being on the phone with insurances, look, you know, for verifications, whatever. My yeah. guy, he charges a, a pretty big percent, but like we get paid very well and have no issues. So definitely, uh, there's definitely pros and cons to all that. I think this is a great place to pause, Joey. What's a good place? I guess rehabceos.com or anywhere else on Facebook. Yeah, rehabceos.com or um, right now we actually, so if you go to school, so skol.com slash rehabceos, we now have about 350 videos of like all of our sales stuff, all of our workshop stuff, hiring, opening clinics, like all of that type of stuff and two free group coaching calls a week inside that community. So you can join there, which you can also find a link at rehabceos.com. But like, it's pretty much our, like a mastermind within it. And then once you're big enough and you maybe want to work with us on a paid capacity, like that's where you go. But until then, like, even if you never spent a dime with us, you can come in and be coached by us inside of school.com slash rehabceos. And that's free? Yeah. Sweet. Nice. We'll link that below. There we go. Awesome, Joey. Well, thank you for your time, man. Great to catch up. Yeah, for sure, man. Hey, it's Dave Kittle. Are you a healthcare business owner or physical therapy practice owner who is looking to figure out your succession plan or exit strategy? We might be able to help. And in fact, we may be interested in acquiring your practice. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. Shoot me an email at dave at conciergepainrelief.com. That's D-A-V-E at C O N. C I E R G E painrelief.com, or you can call me at any time, 646 781 8884.